Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, our gospel lesson, which will be the basis for our meditation, is the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men came from the east, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written in the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means uh, least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them, until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the gospel for the epiphany of our Lord. Have you ever heard of deconstructionism? It was a movement that began in the 1960s to take things apart, to look at the assumptions that's behind an argument. Well, it became popular in a number of different areas, so much so that even a few years ago, they were deconstructing menus So if you went into a restaurant and ordered a deconstructed shepherd's pie, instead of getting shepherd's pie, you would end up with a section of beef and probably a section of cream corn and a section of mashed potatoes and some kind of cooked cheese. At least that's what I put in my shepherd's pie. What you end up with doesn't quite work out the same, though, as when it's all mushed together. Because sometimes the sum of the parts is greater, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. That is to say, you put all of these ingredients together in a shepherd's pie, and the taste is much better than having them all separate. So sometimes the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. But there are other times where it is good, where things have been mashed together, to take them apart and look at the individual components. And that's what we're going to do with the Christmas story this morning. You see, what has often happened because of children's Christmas programs, and I think possibly just to make sure, make sure that there were enough characters for all the kids to play a part. The wise men have been brought in on Christmas Eve amid the shepherds and the, the angels heralding from the distance. No, that's not what happened. And so we're going to take the texts a little bit slower and see them all individually. And the reason that we're going to be looking at the epiphany, the arrival of the wise men today, is because so often it just gets passed over. Because we celebrate the arrival of the wise men on, on the 12th day of, or after the 12th day of Christmas on the day of epiphany. But if church Sunday doesn't happen on epiphany, quite often it just gets left in the dust. So we're taking some time to look at it today. So we're going to backtrack. Christmas Eve, the angels appeared to the shepherds and they heard the good news and they went and saw this thing that had happened. Then you go forward eight more days. And Mary and Joseph had the child named. And Jesus was circumcised. That's what this, the eighth day of Christmas, is. The circumcision of our Lord and the naming of Jesus. You fast forward then to day 40, 
day 40, Mary and Joseph took Jesus to uh, Jerusalem, to the temple. And there, Simeon saw this child that he had been told that he would see before, the Lord, before uh, his death. And he says, Lord, you can now let your servant go in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Which then brings us to Matthew's text. Matthew doesn't give us an exact date when the wise men appeared. We know it was probably sometime after Jesus was 40 days old, and at a maximum, that, that, that Jesus was two years old because uh, Herod uh, had all the babies killed that were under two years old, all the male babies killed that were under two years old, um, trying to get rid of the Christ child. So we have Matthew recording this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men came from the east to Jerusalem. Note, they didn't just immediately come to Bethlehem to see this child. They first went to Jerusalem. Now, we call them wise men or magi because that is the New Testament term for them. But I'm sure that you have heard them referred to as kings, especially in the hymn, We three kings of Orient are, bearing gifts we traverse afar, field and fountain, moor and mountain, following yonder star. The reason that they were often called kings is because of the Old Testament prophecy about their coming that we heard in the Old Testament lesson from Isaiah. Nation shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Perhaps these magi knew the scriptures and when they saw the star, they came to see the child because in Numbers we read, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Maybe they were motivated by some other way than Scripture, using astrology or something. But whatever it was, these wise men, were, it was revealed to them to come and worship the newborn king of Israel. The wise men, however, didn't show up in Bethlehem. They needed God's word to ultimately bring them to their destination. That's what God's word does. It gives us clarity. It brings us to Jesus. Instead, these wise men show up in Herod's court and ask the question, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star. There was no newborn boy in Herod's court. And so Herod was troubled. You see, these wise men weren't really kings, but they were important enough that they got an audience with Herod. But also Herod wasn't a true king. He himself would have never been accepted as a king by the Jews because he himself was only half Jewish. But more than that, he wasn't there ruling and reigning over his territory. He was simply acting on behalf of the Caesar. But Herod wouldn't tolerate anyone coming to usurp his throne, his power, his reign. And so he seeks to destroy this newborn king of the Jews. He admonishes the wise men to go and search diligently for the child that I may too come and worship him. These wise men, they don't have to search diligently for the child. God takes them right to the place when they once again saw the star. And it came and rested over the place where they found the child. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. They recognized that Jesus is the king, which is a very important point. He is not just a future king or a potential king. They recognize that even there as an infant, he is the king. Because God is ruling and reigning over all creation. The king is before them. And it's not just any king. It is the king who is the Lord. And so these wise men worship him. Not just pay him homage, but worship. Because that is what we do 
we come to worship a living God. And we come with our offerings like the wise men did. They came bearing gold and frankincense and myrrh. For you and I, we bring our treasures also. But more importantly, God calls us to be living sacrifices. That our entire lives are to belong to him. On this day where the world makes resolutions, they'll look back at the previous year and complain about the parts that weren't good, and they will have some general hope that the future will be better. And they leave it at that. For you and for me, we understand it differently. There's not just a one day a year turning and trying to make things better where we make resolutions and recognize that we need to uh, quit something or start doing more activity. But instead, Christ calls us to a daily repentance, to daily pick up our cross and follow him, to daily deny ourselves, not to deny ourselves things like candies and cookies and rich food, but to deny our very selves, our wants, our desires, so that we put God first and we look to the needs of our neighbor in love. Christ reveals himself to you as your king who rules and reigns over you. On this day where, on the eighth day of Christmas, where we would uh, celebrate the naming of Christ, that his name was indeed Jesus, which means the Lord is salvation. The Lord saves. Know that Jesus puts that name on you because you have been given a good name, a new name, in the waters of your baptism. You have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. God has put his name on you to mark you as his own dear, precious child. Dear saints of God, you are called to be part of his kingdom. You see, with Christ your king, you are made part of that kingdom. The British have a tradition at Christmas of opening crackers, those little things where you pull both ends and a little toy pops out to celebrate uh, the, little or the gifts that the wise men brought. And inside there's a joke or two which are meant to tell you that at Christmas you are to be of good cheer, to have humor. And then inside there's a little paper crown that you take and put on your head. And some traditions say that it is to remind you that Jesus is your king. Other traditions say it is to commemorate the giving of gifts by the wise men. But I would point you to a third crown, that Christ who rules and reigns gives you a crown of life, a crown of glory. We hear it in scripture. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And again, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. And again, be faithful unto death, and you will receive the crown of life. And again, hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Dear saints of God, Christ gives you the crown of eternal life. Cling to it. Cling to your faith. Cling to Christ, your Savior, who saves you, knowing that he has crowned you with salvation. That you are made heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ in his kingdom that will have no end. Now, I began by talking about deconstructionism, that movement where you take things apart. When you look at what Jesus Christ has come to do, he saw this world with Adam's sin, and that is exactly what he came to do, to deconstruct it, to take it apart, but this time to undo the power of sin. So to undo the power of sin, he himself never sinned, living a sinless life. To undo the power of death, he himself died and rose again, victorious over death and the grave. To be victorious over Satan, Satan has been cast from heaven. He can no longer accuse you of your sins. He is a defeated foe. 
Christ, who has come to save you, he crowned you with life and salvation. He, he and he alone, will let you be part of his kingdom, a kingdom that will have no end, because he is putting it all back together, this time without sin or sorrow or pain or suffering or death, and Satan has no influence. And his promise is that when he comes again in glory, you will live with him in that kingdom that will have no end. Christ, your king, will come to gather you to himself. And so we pray to the Lord, thy kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen. Merry Christmas and blessed Epiphany. Amen.